Um, I'd like to do two acknowledgements before we start. I'd like to acknowledge the founder of the Victoria Peace School, Bill Geimer, whose idea this was. Um, Bill is a lawyer, I think more or less retired, other than by advice that he gives out freely from time to time, um, and has been a peace activist for most of his life. And um, he, his big, there's a thing in, in business called a BHAG. Do you know what that is? Big, hairy, audacious goal. <laughs> so his BHAG was that he really wanted to take what he had done as an activist and a peace encourager and spread the word and spread the knowledge and in fact the skills of peace to a larger audience of regular folks like us. I personally knew nothing about any of this about two years ago and uh, midway through COVID or so, there was this little notice that came out from our community choir, the director of whom is sitting over here on that one, um, who uh, was putting out notices on behalf of choir members to say, hey, all of you people who are housebound with nothing to do, uh, Monday evening uh, for the next couple of weeks, there's a, a series of discussions that are going to be hosted by Dr. Mary Wynne Ashford, one of our choir members. And it's Monday night at seven o'clock, and if you'd like to join in, it'll be a very interesting discussion about global governance and the United Nations. So I thought, let's see, Monday night, seven o'clock, middle of COVID. Hmm, don't think I have anything on the go? So I thought I would jump in just because it sounded interesting and it turned out to be fundamentally, um, profoundly world-changing for me. It certainly changed my worldview because I became acquainted with some information and some experience from people who have been incredibly involved at a local level and in fact at the global level in developing peace strategies and working in the world of the United Nations, which you'll hear more about. If you read Mary Wynne's bio, you will have read that she's been in that world for a very, very long time. And uh, her greatest strength is that she has a million stories of what all of that has looked like over the many years that she's been doing it. So um, I would also like to, before we begin, to acknowledge that we are on the, Lekong, the territories of the Lekongan speaking people. And as such, we appreciate the care and maintenance that they have done to make this a lovely place, and this a lovely place, for us to spend a few hours discussing a rather weighty topic called world peace. So when people ask you, what are you doing these days? You say, oh, I'm just working on world peace. <laughs> Which I think probably, given the way the world is right now, is probably a very, very appropriate thing for us all to be thinking about and doing. So um, I expect you already know a little bit about Mary Wynne and her background, but she'll tell you a little bit more about things. Here's how the evening will go. Mary Wynne's got some things she'd like to share with you. And then we're going to workshop together and discuss some ideas together. And our goal is that by the end of this evening, and in fact after each of our sessions, you will have, I think, some ideas and some, um, some thoughts that you maybe would like to share with others. And in the grand scheme of things, drip by drip, drop by drop, maybe we can make the world a better place together. So that's our plan for this evening. Thank you very much for masking up. Dr. Mary Lynn Ashford, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. I'm going to use the microphone, and the reason I do is that I've been told that elderly people like me um, don't hear consonants as clearly as we used to, and it really helps to have things um, amplified. And the other reason is that some people have English as a second language, and if you've ever listened, if you speak a second language and you've listened to it uh, amplified, it's very, very much easier for you to, to keep up, so that's why I'm doing that. And I want to thank you very, very much for wearing your masks. It's probably a psychological thing for me. Um, I am a doctor, yes. I was totally vaccinated all the way up the minute I could get all of those shots. Last November, I got long COVID, and it didn't end until the middle of July this year. And boy, oh boy, I don't want any of you to get it and go through that, and I don't want to ever get it again. I also have a friend who's had it three times now, in spite of being fully vaxxed. So I am a bit hyper about that. Anyway, I've had my flu shot, I've had my COVID shot. I don't mind if you take your masks off, but if you're coming close to me, selfishly, please put your mask on. Yeah, please protect me. Okay. Now, I have to ask you a very embarrassing question. Is there anyone here who didn't have a chance to watch the movie? There are, okay. I thought there probably would be, since I often do that. <laughs> Turn up someplace without having uh, noticed that you had to watch the movie first. So what I'm gonna do is just give a quick rundown of the movie, and this will be very 
um, inaccurate. This isn't a sort of historical documenting of the, uh, of the film. But I think the reason a lot of you have come is that you did watch the movie, and it's just an incredible story. It's just, you, you keep thinking, I cannot believe that they did this and that it's all been documented, and most of the footage is, is uh, original footage. So the story is this. Um, there's an island called Bougainville. It's a country. And it's close to Papua New Guinea. That's just north of Australia, about a 1,000 miles. And um, it was a, an absolutely beautiful um, tropical paradise until in the 1960s they discovered copper. In fact, they discovered it's the world's biggest uh, place of, of copper, um, and it would be worth about $60 billion. So the Australians first went in and started mining it, paying no attention to the fact that there were people there. We've heard that story before, haven't we? <laughs> so they went in and they started just um, mining and, and tearing everything down. You, you'll see the, the images. I hope you will watch the movie afterward. I'm not going to ruin it for you just by telling you everybody knows it ends with peace. So, um, so the, um, the, finally the um, Bougainvillean people rose up and, and uh, started fighting with the Australians. Now the way they, they, they could do that was that um, Bougainville had been overrun several times. It was at one point taken up by the Germans and then by the Japanese during the war. Uh, and then as we'll hear, the Australians and the um, Papua New Guineans. So they, the Japanese, when they fled after, at the end of the war, left behind all of their weapons and carefully sealed in boxes with ammunition. So the native people of Bougainville um, began attacking the Australians and eventually the Australians pulled out and then Papua New Guineans took it over instead and it became a province of Papua, Papua New Guinea. However, every so often, um, Bougainville declares that it's independent and everyone ignores that and uh, they continue to plunder the copper resources. So eventually, the um, Papua New Guinea people who invaded were, were just carrying out horrendous atrocities. And the people rose up and the uh, Papua New Guineans eventually withdrew. Then, um, Australia and New Zealand got together to say, let's, let's take over this copper. And uh, they, because they, they knew that they were going to meet resistance, they put a blockade up all the way around the island. So the people had no food and no medicines, and the children were literally starving. The women then got together and started to run the blockade in the middle of the night in, in boats, um, risking their lives. There, there are images of this in the, uh, in the movie where you can see all of these ships on the ocean and the women in these flat boats, motor boats, um, running the blockade to get food and medicine for their families. So eventually, they got rid of the Papua New Guineans, and then there was a civil war within um, Bougainville. So eventually, the UN went and spoke to New Zealand and said, your hands are more or less clean. Uh, you may be the only honest broker around here. Can you resolve this? And they spoke to Alexander Downer, who was a foreign minister of Australia at that time. And um, he said, that's, that's not going to work. Um, there's no military solution to this. This has to be a negotiated arrangement that, that comes out of this. And, and the whole thing is not just. Well, they talked to New Zealand, and the general also agreed that um, there was no military solution to this. He said he had been in Vietnam, he had served there, and he had served in Angola, and he said, we have to do something different. So what different? Well, first they tried flying in and flying out 50 key people from, from both sides um, to a place uh, outside of, 
of Bougainville where they could have some peace talk. So they tried that to start with. The original airplane that went in was shot and um, the pilot, instead of saying, we've been attacked, said, oh, we've had a mechanical failure and they just glossed over it and still got 50 people out to hold a uh, peace conference. Not terribly successful. Um, so after that, they said, well, what else can we do here? And eventually they decided that the New Zealand Army uh, military force, could be uh, an, their army and navy, um, could go in with guitars. And they would not be armed, they would make it obvious that they were not armed, and they would not tell the people what to do. They would go in and they would listen. They would not be there to say, here's what you have to do. So they went in and you, you see them landing, um, getting off the plane with their guitars. There's men and women in this force and they had also decided to make it a mixed force with Maori uh, soldiers as well and that um, everyone would learn to do haka. Now I don't know, if you haven't seen the movie, you don't know what haka is, but this is a traditional um, pseudo-war thing that uh, it's like a dance that the um, Maoris do uh, and it's it's kind of an agreement that will show how fierce we, I'm, I'm making this up, this is my conclusion, so if you're from New Zealand and can correct me, please do, but it looks to me as if there, it's a traditional thing where you say, I am so big and strong, you better be afraid, and the other people say the same thing and eventually you say, yeah, well, we're all really strong, so let's not fight. So. Everyone learned to do haka. The women, these are not Maori, and, and all, all of them in their uniforms doing this haka thing, which is absolutely wonderful to watch. Gradually, they start to um, bring people over, and you can see that, that the, the um, people are starting to think, we just can't continue this way, we can't continue this way. And the women are an extremely important part of this um, saying that the, this fighting has to end, we can't continue this way. So eventually they do decide that they will have a, um, a peace conference and uh, a, a formal peace conference to have a peace accord. And they are able to, at the end of 10 years, they are able to uh, sign a peace accord, but there's one group of rebels that won't sign on. So it's still um, sort of thrown back with people fighting again and, uh, and the women coming forward to say, no, this, this isn't going to work, we have to have a peace accord. So eventually, after 10 years of war, uh, they signed the peace accord. Now, what have I missed out of that? Um, I think that's it. Is there anything that I've missed and that's needed for the people who haven't, don't, haven't seen the movie? Okay. So what you see in the movie is the actual people who were involved with the negotiations. You see the women who are in the uh, New Zealand military and they're talking in the present day describing what happened but then you see original footage as well. So that's why it's, it's so... Um, amazing and, and really beautifully done. So now what I'd like to do is have you go into, this is just a little warm up thing. I want you to go to where these sheets are up on the wall. They're, they're, stat, they're held there by static and um, you can have a cloth at each place and if it starts to come off the, the window, you just rub it with a cloth and it'll stick again. And use a, a dry erase marker what I want you to do is write down what you remember, so this will have to rely on the people who've, who've seen the movie, what were the key things that made this possible? What were the, some of the key ingredients? What needed to be there in order that New Zealand would be able to go in and take guitars and everybody didn't get killed? What were some of the key things? And just allow yourself to think really freely. What, what were the, the things that you noticed that made you go, oh, yeah, that's, that's why it happened. So if you don't mind, just clump yourselves. I think it'll be about six people 
to a plastic sheet, and Colin has got the dry erase markers and the cloths. And I want you just to put on your thinking caps, your, your thinking up right now about what is it that made this possible and why would it not be possible in another war situation that you can probably think of right now. So let's do that. Let's take about 10 minutes. Okay? First, you can take your mask off while you talk. Sure. If people can hear me like this, I'll do my best to project and not spew potential cold and virus and flu bugs at you. Um, we had a great discussion, and a lot of people remember different things. Um, one was when the New Zealand general went in, um, he spoke multiple languages and made an effort to speak in various languages to help facilitate communication. We also noticed the human touch, like Dick mentioned, that people were shaking hands and going out of their way to relate to people one-on-one. -on -one. The Maori greedies uh, stood out for us, and partly because of COVID times, we were wondering, well, how would they do their traditional greeting? Because that involves touching, being very physically close, touching noses, exchanging breath. Um, the other things you listed were the government's willingness to be open and vulnerable, putting aside egos and focusing on solutions, making peace the goal, um, that sense that there wasn't a deadline or a timeline that we had to impose externally. Music, of course, the guitars, the haka. Equal participation right from the get-go of the women of the society. It's a matriarchal society and their desires and needs and knowledge and wisdom was really important to bring to the table. Um, also including indigenous people, not just from Bougainville, but also the New Zealand troops. They, they tried to choose people to come on this mission who were also indigenous, so they would be able to relate in some sort of cultural way. The helicopter story stood up for me too. I was like, oh, that pilot made a very conscious decision how to report that he had an issue, because I'm assuming many people would have been listening in to those radio communications. And last but not least, um, the troops were trying to relate to people as human beings. So playing with the children, being really <coughs> personable, being open-minded, open-hearted. And um, the phrase non-military military was used, so no guns. And the courage that it must take for people who are trained to bring a military solution to go into a place you know, without their armor. So, Lots of great points from our Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Who's next there? Is that you, Glenn? Go ahead. Richard. Richard. I'm sorry. So uh, I'm just going to give what I, I wasn't writing it down. Here. Humility on both sides. Nonviolence. Necessity. People were starving, so there was a need. Having Maori involved in New Zealand, not sending Australians. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I have to confess, I only saw the first thirty or thirty-five minutes of the movie, so I'm not sure. Okay. How. <laughs> uh, not uh, understanding Boobie the bee Boobie culture. Boobie Boobie. Boobie. Oh, okay. Uh, music stories dance, using culture as a catalyst, uh, the leadership of the New Zealand general. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I'm really impressed by that general. Uh, he, he just said, all right, we'll do it this different way, and jumped in with both feet. That was really courageous. Yeah, thanks. Margaret. And the willingness to be vulnerable across the board. Uh, and belief in the other. One major country leader who thought outside the box. Uh, warring became seen as not providing a solution. A, a respect for culture and willingness to listen. And women, music, and guitars. Thank you. Very overlapping kind of people. Um, the, a lot of the New Zealand troops um, share cultural values with the Golden Buildings. Um, yeah. 
Um, you need the mic, I think, to speak up. Or, or just or, shout. Yeah. Okay. Take your mask off. Uh, <laughs> take your mask off and talk. I'll project. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the New Zealand troops are unarmed, so the threat was reduced. Uh, the Bogan Billions, um, which was a really good point, that they, they didn't have a super long, you know, thousand year um, history of discord among themselves. Good point. So, yeah, maybe it wasn't so hard to remember that they used to like each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, matrilineal society um, and the fact that New Zealand had female troops, um, the women had a, a voice in their society and were instrumental in um, brokering the peace. Um, having a God squad, so again, <laughs> Uh, thinking about their cultural values and uh, aligning with that, uh, with their beliefs, music and other cultural engagement, the singing and dancing, one-on-one uh, -on -one with people individually in villages, and and the fact that the the society had a process of reconciliation, um, breaking the arrows, and um, initiated by the <coughs> victims. So, Okay. Good hand to you. I'm just going to put up this little thing to remind me, and um, you may not be able to read it, but I will. There's an organization called International Alert. They're now just called Alert. And they go into zones of conflict with experts um, to assess the peace building capacity of a particular society that, that is in conflict. And um, there, there's one um, leader from Alert who came through Victoria a number of years ago and gave a talk at UVic about what they look for. And this is uh, some of the points that, that he made. First of all, they look at the leaders and say, are the leaders the problem or are the leaders going to be the source of the solution? And uh, the leaders, um, it's, it's not just is there a dictator, but rather are there leaders, opinion leaders, uh, respected leaders that, that we can work with. Um, secondly, what are the cultural traditions of peacemaking? And often in, um, in these conflict zones, you will find that there are religious leaders who have traditionally uh, helped bring, bring about the peace. For example, the, the uh, Buddhist monks will often be called upon to pull groups together and to do some mediation. Um, religion. Religion can be a cause of the conflict and uh, unfortunately and can be an obstacle or it can be the, the foundation of the community that they can go back and draw upon. And I think that's what we saw in this, in the movie, was that the um, the religious faith was was very, very strong and that the people, especially the women, were going back to the church and then going back out saying, how are we going to do this and how do we do um, forgiveness? How do we do, how do we meet with the other? Uh, women, what is the role of women in the society? The women, if the women are cloistered and not a part of the decision making, it's not going to be easy to, uh, to engage them to help, but on the other hand, they're going to have to be on board by the time they get an agreement. So where the women are strong, as they certainly are in this community in Bougainville, uh, in a matrilineal society, the women could come together and just say, we are going to do this, and they really were risking their lives every step of the way. Um, who are the trusted voices? There, this may be elders in a community. It may be, um, it may possibly be a foreigner who has come and has been teaching or something like that. Who are the people that the community turns to, uh, and you need to engage those people? Army. Uh, army. army? Oh yeah, I missed army. Thank you. The army. This is a really interesting one. There's an author named Jean Sharp, G-E-N-E -E, Sharp, who was quite famous. He wrote a number of books about nonviolent success stories, and uh, his material was used in uh, some of the various uprisings after the 
uh, collapse of the Berlin Wall, when all of those dictatorships were toppling, people were passing Gene Sharp's books around or reprints of his strategies of nonviolence. So what he says is, if the army is loyal to the dictator, don't try nonviolent intervention because you're going to be killed or sent to jail. You wait until you can see that the army has shifted and the army is on your side. And that's, and that's what happened in, uh, in Eastern Europe, was that once the people started to hit the streets, the soldiers refused to shoot them. And when that happens, then, and the dictators know this perfectly well, if they don't have the army with them, then they're finished. Um, supportive forces from the outside. This would be things like economic opportunities or uh, treaties that might be formed provided that they get a peace agreement, some kind of benefit that is coming to the community if they're able to reach an accord. And trusted outside interveners. So people like um, uh, International Alert, who, and the, like, the, um, like the army as they went in, in this case, who said, we're not here to tell you what to do. We will back you up, we will support you, but it, this is going to be your decisions and your peace. So those are some of the things, um, and I'm sure that now, it's been a long time since I heard Ed Garcia give this talk, but uh, there are many, many other things that they would weigh to, to look at and see, are we gonna be able to bring about a, a nonviolent peace here? So then I wanna talk about some of the other um, examples and uh, I should tell you, I left a uh, pile of these papers at the, at the back. Um, I thought that there were going to be 17 people here, so I brought 30, but <laughs> I don't know if everybody got one. It says, what does peace building involve and what is peace building? These are uh, printout from the website of International Alert, and I'm sorry that I didn't get a credit um, put onto that, so these are not my original ones, but they are from Alert, and I think you'll find them really interesting. So what I want to do is talk about other examples where um, nonviolence has been used and succeeded. And the, the one that pops into my mind right away is the Philippines. So uh, Ferdinand Marcos was this brutal dictator who ran the Philippines um, just in, a, in an incredibly cruel way for um, well over, tw I think over 20 years. And the people were agitating that but they would be killed or imprisoned if they were objecting. The Catholic Church in the Philippines is very, very strong. And people are very, very devout. And uh, so they, the, they, there was a network of churches all over the Philippines where they were having meetings, you know, in the basement and, and talking about how, what they would do if an occasion arose uh, when they could see their way to, to a nonviolent uh, way of toppling Marcos. So what happened was they went on for years. Um, I met some of the protesters before this toppling of, of Marcos, and they said, yes, they marched every weekend, and uh, this ophthalmologist said, we walk with our arms locked together and stay close to the center of the road because the people on the edge of the road are picked off and they're found dead in the ditch the next day. So then in 1986, um, people began to, to really, um, they were really networking and particularly through the Catholic Church. So Cardinal Sin was the head of the, the Catholic Church very, very active, and they had a policy called um, constructive engagement, I think it was called. Constructive, no, critical collaboration, which meant that they didn't actually fight the regime, but they criticized it, and, and that was their um, kind of compromise. So what happened was that four military officers um, mutinied, and they locked themselves into a building in the downtown. So Marcos sent in the tanks to go and take them out. Cardinal Sin got onto the Catholic radio and said, everyone into the streets, don't let the tanks get into the downtown. Uh, don't let them take out these men. 
So four million people went into the streets. It took four days, four, day, four, four days and nights, uh, of people in the streets with people sort of spelling each other off, bringing food and going off to go to the bathroom and come back in and, and take their place again. And one of the women told me that actually there was a very festive kind of atmosphere. It was like a big picnic and that people were laughing and singing and she said her neighbor said to her, you know, we could actually die here. And she said, well, it's in a good cause. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, a huge, huge amount of courage. And at the end of four days, Marcos fled. And then the, uh, the people were able to write their constitution. Um, unfortunately, I wish I could say these, these stories all have happy endings that, yeah. and they dance off into the sunset, but that isn't what happens. We know that um, then different governments are elected and all kinds of problems continue. So we're human beings, but at least we can do some things and get rid of some injustices and, and continue to progress from there. So what the Filipino people did after they had had um, this success, well, first of all, I should tell you that this success was 1986. The Berlin Wall fell in 89. And then after that, 80 dictators have been toppled nonviolently. 60 were toppled in the immediate uh, time after 1989, but then it has continued and, and more and more dictators are toppled. Unfortunately, some of them, um, like Syria, have not been successful. They've been very, very bloody and, and not finished yet. Uh, however, what the Philippine people did was they began teaching some of these nonviolent strategies to people from other countries. So there were visitors from Colombia who were um, facing a problem similar to one that people in the Philippines had had before, which was that there were two factions. There was the army on the one hand and the guerrilla fighters on the other hand. And the villagers were caught in the middle. So the army would come in and execute villagers saying, you are colluding with the, um, with the rebels. And then uh, the guerrillas would come in and say, you are colluding with the army and kill the people again. Kill a different group of people. <laughs> so, no, not kill the same one again, but. <laughs> anyway, um, what the, what the Philippines, Filipinos did was they established a zone of peace and they marked it out on the ground and they said, this is our village, this is a zone of peace, do not enter here bearing weapons. And both sides obeyed. Now, and that's amazing, isn't it? But they did. They said, the, the villagers said to them, who are you trying to protect? And they said, oh, we're trying to protect you, of course. Well, thanks very much, but the way to protect us is to stop coming in with weapons. So the people in Colombia tried the same thing and set up zones of peace. And again, for a period of a couple of years, they succeeded in making a zone of peace so that the, um, the villagers could produce their crops again. And again, it's a situation that uh, started to deteriorate because of other frank injustices in the country. And, and these things are not done until you have justice. We know this saying, there is no peace without justice. So that's two of the stories. And another one is the hospital in Sarajevo. The hospital was a multi-ethnic, multi-religious organization in Sarajevo, and um, during the war there, they were determined to keep it that way, that the doctors and nurses uh, would care for whatever patients came in. It was not, um, we will only care for Muslims, or we'll only not care for Muslims, or whatever. And um, I met some of the, the uh, physicians from this hospital um, at a meeting at the UN, and they, they said, we have succeeded thanks to the engagement of our people, thanks to a wish to help, thanks to the courage and devotion of medical staff, thanks to respect for human rights, thanks to our efforts to preserve a multi-ethnic, multi-religious community, thanks to the unselfish aid of many humanitarian and other organizations from the whole world. They had to um, withstand the siege there for three years. Um, in this in this hospital, um, trying to smuggle in 
food and medicines and so on and care for their patients. An amazing story. So then, what I want to tell you is some of the lessons from these communities. And uh, you've, you've provided a whole series of the lessons from that one um, community, but this, this is uh, what the communities that have managed to do nonviolent successes, this is what they have said. As that having a sense of altruism, of being called to show the highest possibilities of being human, having a sense of dignity, identity, and self-respect. The ingenuity and initiatives were homegrown, not handed to them by outsiders. They have a moral code, decency, equality, respect for life, and the individual came to hold more value than raw power, threats, and money. They had a strong feeling that information about human rights, the Geneva Conventions, and other UN conventions should be widely disseminated and acted upon. The spiritual dimension was acknowledged as important to the vast majority of these communities. Religious or cultural traditions were pointed to as a source of resilience, perseverance, and hope. Respect for nature was often a part of this framework. They had a shared vision and goal, the key element was ownership of the programs uh, by those who got involved. There was often a charismatic leader, but there was a model of leadership that with the people rather than above the people, so that if a leader got killed, the rest of the uh, community would still continue. They, they, the idea was the strong part. Different organizational structure emphasized participation and equality. The ideal structure was described as more circular than linear, emphasizing sharing responsibility and decision making, as well as the process of seeking and reaching consensus. They had a culture of dialogue, building personal relationships across barriers, focusing on practical results, building the legal base for equality, the importance of a legitimate economic base, disseminating skills and knowledge, having courage and hope, external recognition, and struggle and fun. That struggle and fun comes out when you talk to people uh, about <laughs> these terribly dangerous things that they have done. They often find it funny, and they'll, they'll tell you the, the jokes and the stories. The, the joke I heard about Sarajevo was, um, how can you tell a Christian from the Muslim in, in Sarajevo? Well, the Christian is the one who doesn't go to mass, and the uh, Muslim is the one who doesn't go to mosque. <laughs> <laughs> so now what I want you to think about is, in Canada, we're starting to find a lot of polarization. We're finding that people are angry, um, people respond with um, impulsiveness in, in situations of tension. And I know, yes, we've come through a terrible time of isolation and, and uh, difficulties with the pandemic and now with financial problems. But how do we use all of these learnings to think of what we might do in Canada. How, how, how might we change what we're doing in our own communities in order to um, build the peace capacity of our own community or, or even our own family? So I'll give you a minute or two to think about that and then just please just put up your hand. And are, there, are there things that some of these people, some of these examples uh, brought to light that you think, oh yeah, that would build peace. Dally. Um, two that stuck out from the list Mary one shared were homegrown ideas and respect for nature. It makes me think of the indigenous people of Canada and how much we can learn from their cultures and their way of communicating with each other and supporting each other. Like They've obviously been through very difficult situations in their history, and yet they're still they're still using humor, for example. Mm -hmm. And it was only a year or so ago that I went to an indigenous-led event, and I really noticed the difference of a government-led event with a token Aboriginal person to do a greeting, for example. So I think this idea of homegrown ideas and letting 
they want to participate and, and meeting people where they are really is another way of breaking that. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, that, that's a really important one. I've been impressed by the fact that I listen to the CBC a lot. And when you listen to the indigenous speakers on the radio, they invariably start with gratitude. They don't, you know, they say, well, well, how did you react to this bad situation? And the indigenous person says, well, first, you know, I'd like to express my gratitude that people are listening to us, or whatever it is, there's a gratitude message first, and then a gentle message, and a message of inclusion. So I agree, I think we have a huge amount to learn, and, and we're really lucky that we're, uh, we're being exposed to a different way of talking about, talking through conflict. Thanks. Other ideas, other things that spring to mind about what we can do here in Canada? Affordability. Affordability, absolutely. <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a basic one. Everything. Yeah. Housing is really an issue of justice. And, and as we always say, we can't have peace without justice and we won't have, have peace in our communities until we have a just way of dealing with uh, with housing and also with um, mental illness and also with employment. Yeah, all of those things. There needs to be a capacity uh, for people to come together in some way. That the parties that are not in agreement and in conflict, whatever it happens to be, most of our neighborhoods and so forth are not set up in a way that makes this easily done. And our neighborhoods are separate and distinct in many socio-economic ways as well. So and one of the things I will be talking about when I speak at the next session will be about local peace committees uh, made up of people uh, who are uh, respected. Uh, many of the points that, you, that we have already raised, respected in the community and, and so forth, and representing the full diversity of that community. They Thanks. can make miracles. Thanks, Saul. I think that's really important. Um, I'm noticing all over the world that there's an uh, uh, evolution of citizen assemblies, and they're happening everywhere. They're happening in communities. They're happening in, in cities. In, um, I think in, there's one in Saanich coming up right now. Um, and they're, they're being proposed for the United Nations as an auxiliary to the General Assembly, so it would be an advisory, huge assembly, people not representing nations or interest groups, but looking at issues and uh, setting aside the national um, posturing and so on to advise the General Assembly. So, I, but I really agree too that there's no place for us to just come together and talk. And I keep thinking, you know, there are so many churches that are empty and, and they're not all closing down, but many are. And I'm thinking, surely we can shift and, and come together in order to talk in a cooperative way in those buildings. Those buildings are there and they're conducive to, to exchange of ideas. But anyway, that's, that's one that may get me in hot water with people. <laughs> no. Dally again. Maybe a non-religious way to phrase that would be to like have more community spaces. Like for example, a public libraries are fairly accessible and people can rent space there to gather people. And um, if we had more facilities like that, like I've heard about people who talk about how to design cities and architecture that naturally helps people to have spots to congregate. So just the design of our environment makes a difference, like to have enough park benches so people can gather, or picnic tables. Like this is a great um, example, this facility at the ground, of a way to be accessible to people to gather. Like I brought someone here earlier today, and it's like, hey, it's well lit. There's parking. There's bathroom facilities. Like you need free childcare for people to be able to gather. There's many components that we can come these ideas from? Like that's, that's great. Thanks, Sally. I think the other thing is, um, we need to talk about these things over dinner with friends and in the neighborhood. And um, I can tell you from personal experience that you lose a lot of friends by talking about <laughs> nuclear weapons. <laughs> <laughs> but after a while, people come back and say, yeah, 
You know, you were, you were right about what you said two years ago or ten years ago. <laughs> so, but I think that we need to discuss them without, uh, without getting our egos involved and, and say, how can we have lots and lots of good ideas and we just need to be able to get them out there. Bill, you look like you're going to say something. Yeah, thank you, Mary Lynn. Uh, people tend to stare at their soup also when you bring up the subject of religion. Uh, but uh, one of the things for local communities that we can do, I think, comes to mind tonight. There are people here that I know from at least four different uh, faith communities. And I'm sure there are people here who are from no faith community. And you rightly said that uh, religion can be the force that promotes war and violence, or it can be a force for peace. Uh, and a third option is that it can just sit there and do nothing. Uh, but I think that uh, there is so much that uh, can be done to promote cooperation between people interested in peace and people of faith communities who often do the same good works without knowing what the other ones are doing. So uh, as a suggestion for what we can do within our communities, uh, I would suggest promoting that understanding and cooperation. Thanks a lot, and I, certainly the um, Victorian Multi-Faith Society has just grown, right, leaps and bounds in, in uh, its strength and its complexity. Um, just as an example, they, I can remember about three, well, before, the, before COVID, um, I went to one of the ceremonies at the Hindu Temple, and we were there to, as observers, and that was wonderful. That was a new thing, that they opened up the temple, and we... We had a meal, and it was, it was a very rich experience. The next time I went, there were participants from all the other faiths, and the, the Hindu temple incorporated a new kind of ceremony, a service, that included the other religions. And I think that's just, that's a huge statement of acceptance. So, yeah, thanks, Bill. Benny. I think it's really important, particularly now, to acknowledge and listen to young people, because it's young people that are going to be dealing with all the chaos that's in the world right now. And so many of them are very rich in ideas and inspiration. And they need to be acknowledged and encouraged and brought into these discussions that we're talking about, because they often are not. It's, it's interesting. In, in my organization, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War Canada, we have two young staff people who are um, graduating in political science this coming year. So we've had them as our, our staff for three years. And um, what they say is, well, just, I don't know, we have to figure out some way to get the old people involved with us. I mean, we're working so hard. How do we get in touch with them? <laughs> <laughs> so we do, we do, we need, need to cross paths. And I want to say something about music too, because music is so important. When you come together, it's so important in, in building a uh, community to, to sing together. Yeah. Maybe Dick could comment a little bit on that as well. That would be great. Sorry. Would you comment about the role of music in building, building community? Well, I, I know uh, our choir, if we get the higher choir, collaborated with uh, Mary Wynn at several meetings with schools uh, here in the Victoria area. And I, I think you wrote a report saying how much more engaged the, the students were when we did include music and, and some singing along together, not just listening to people on stage, yeah. but to encourage mm -hmm. the, the sharing of emotion and heart and, uh, uh, and, and shared you know, words of music. Dick, Dick and Kathy and about 12 singers from the Gettin' Higher Choir would come with us. What Jonathan Down and I were speaking in high schools about nuclear weapons. And uh, <laughs> some of these meetings were at 8 o'clock in the morning. But this group would come, and Dick and Kathy would lead a song and then teach it to all of the students. Students didn't want to sing. They wanted to know the truth. 
and go, oh, oh, oh. But eventually, they would join in. And I was keeping a spreadsheet. I'm not the kind of person who keeps spreadsheets, but I was keeping a spreadsheet about all of the schools that we visited. And we, we spoke to 2,200 students. And I recorded what happened at each one and whether the choir was there or not. When the choir was there, the students stayed a half hour longer. They skipped their next classes. They became engaged and went to the library and we heard back from the teachers. And the same thing with the adult community groups like Kiwanis that they would stay longer if we sang together because there's something that tells you you're not alone when, you're, when you can sing together. I don't think we've got time to sing. I think we, we really need to wrap this up, don't we? There's a two more hands that were up. Two more hands up? Oh, I was just going to say, building on that, it's, it's quite true. It's like you have to engage adults is through the children because the children come home with the ideas and then educate the parents and the parents are brought in. And so, uh, it's like, can, can teaching aids be given? Like my nephew's a teacher of social studies in Vancouver, you know, like he, he teaches this. And also I was wondering about partnering or with other grassroots organizations like Go to Victoria acting together who already have a superb network of non-denominational and community groups. I mean, because it's already there. Rich Victoria is a fire with people differently abled uh, including people who are um, physically capable and, and good singers, but other people who want to come together and sing. Yeah. There was another hand along the way. Hand over here. No. You gave up. <laughs> okay. Well, then I think I'll. I think I'll call it to a, a close. I think we've been an hour and a half, an hour and thirty-five. Um, it's been great being with you. Thank you for all of your contributions and your participation. It's been really good fun. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you everyone so much for making the effort to come. I'd like to share something with you from my point of view. Uh, do any of you know who Seth Godin is? He's an American um, author, writer, thought leader, an amazing, amazing guy who has written a blog every day for 27 years, which is amazing. Um, and he's written like 25 books or whatever, and he still publishes a blog every day. And I, I get them because they inspire me, and he's a, kind of become a real thought leader. And he says this, and I love it that we finished up with this little, little comment. Um, and it sort of speaks to why it's important for this small group even to be here, and he says, it's an article he wrote called Preaching to the Choir. Ah. <laughs> the original expression implies that preaching to, the, preaching to the converted is a waste of time. After all, why bother marketing to people who are already on the team? The reality is that the people who aren't enrolled in the journey are going to ignore you. They're simply not open to being marketed to, taught, talked at, or lectured. On the other hand, the folks who are in on it have a chance to become members of the choir, and they are the ones that spread the word. It's peer-to-peer -peer interaction that shapes our culture, and culture that shapes our world. The opportunity for anyone seeking to make a change happen is to enlist people who are on a similar path and give them the tools and the motivation to engage with the people around them. This is an inside job. We look at world peace as being something so far beyond our reach that there is absolutely no way that we feel empowered to do anything about it until you have a conversation with one person, and that leads to another person and then someone shares an idea, and a potential, and an opportunity, and then you have choirs singing to kids, and then the next thing you know, and you never know where this is gonna end, other than you put out a good vibe into the world, and you hope for the best. And I think if there's one thing that we can give our young people today that they are struggling with, it's hope. And so if we could do anything well, it is, in my opinion, to share the things that are hopeful, so I don't read the popular news, anymore. <laughs> uh, I tend to read uh, reasonstobecheerful.org, which is a great publication that does <laughs> nothing but share good news about things that are going right with the world. And there's millions of things going right with the world. Civil society organizations are making a difference. Things are happening at the UN. The big stuff looks ugly and like it's not happening at all. And it's not true. There's a lot of good things happening in the world. And I think the more we share and the more we talk about it and we come together, even in small groups like this, is like a pebble. And all of a sudden, things get better. So that's my little part of this, and I hope that you will have the opportunity to come back and listen to our next lecturer. Um, Saul is gonna talk about some of the things that he's experienced and things that he shares and knows about. And I believe that the opportunity is actually to, um, to take one good idea 
and just share it mm -hmm. as best you can Thank and be you. a guide. Mention the evaluation. Yes, and if you could, please, we want to know what you would like to know more about. If it's places, people, opportunities, readings, articles, websites, whatever it is that you might be looking for, and we will do our very best to try and come up with some of that information for you. Um, there is an evaluation, which if you could take just a couple of minutes to uh, to let us what you let us know what you think, that would be great. And so, you have a comment or so about yes, what you're covering yeah. next week. Our next one. So I'd just like to briefly preview our next uh, talk, which will be on November the 7th. Uh, and this is entitled uh, Civil Society and Peace Building. And we've had some lead into that today, because we are civil society, and we've been talking about peace building. But I'm going to be uh, giving some dramatic examples of successes around the globe that have occurred. Uh, I want to build up our optimism, our, 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 our hopefulness against uh, what is the turmoil in the world today, uh, the rise of, uh, of the right, uh, the uh, persistence and, and growing uh, conflicts, wars, and so forth, and, and a number of remarkable achievements of people in civil society who have organized successfully. and. Uh, this is, this is extremely important for us. And then I'm going to talk about uh, actual organization. I'm going to give examples of different organizations and what they do and how they work together. And I'm especially wanting to spend some time on what has become known as infrastructures for peace, uh, infra or, or an architecture for peace, something that's sorely missing in virtually every country on the planet. We have exquisitely organized militaries, defense so-called defense departments, war departments, as they were called until after World War II. We need to have a, a, a consistent, formal, and informal organization that stands uh, in, con in, in, in contrast to these organizations. These are not organizations that just come together uh, around a given conflict, but these are permanent structures, these are peace building structures that remain in place just like the military remains in place, perhaps not forever, but uh, it's a very important set of institutions that are starting to grab hold in the world and which I want to uh, talk to you about when we meet on November the 7th. So I hope you can come. I think you will uh, uh, not regret it. I think we're, we're, we're going to move forward actually from this talk building further on what we can do uh, as individuals organized in, 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 in groups. Thank you. Thank you.